hi, I'm, I'm Anthony. I'm going to tell you everything you need if you're a startup founder to grow your company, raise investment, incentivize your team, and get all the legals right. Now, legals is super boring, and I'm amazed that anyone arrived with the, with the title of legals. So let me ask, who in the, in the room is a first-time founder? All right, we've got some founders. Who's planning on raising investment for their startup? A few people. All right, and now, who is from Europe? Everyone from Europe. Excellent. All right, so I'm going to take you through the, the, the journey of a startup from incorporating your business through raising and then potentially to exit, and there's things to look out for. And I think for many first-time founders, it's really confusing. You don't know which things to do. And what we've done at Seed Legals, which is in the UK, and as you've heard about, one in six of all UK start early stage funding rounds is done on Seed Legals, is we've productized each step of your startup. And with more than 30,000 companies on the platform, we've got a huge amount of information that I love to share because although every startup idea is different, the formula is remarkably the same. And if you can understand the formula, you're going to make yourself much more investable because astute investors, repeat investors, look for a pattern when they invest. So we're going to start right at the beginning, which is get your cap table right. So when you start your company, you're going to create some shares, which you're going to allocate to the founders. Now, sometimes people look to Mark Zuckerberg and they'd look to make special super voting shares for founders. Don't do that. 100% of the time people do that, it's a disaster and it needs to be undone. So I'm from the UK. I know the UK uh, naming conventions for shares, but generally the founders just get ordinary shares and you'll split it between the founders. So that's really easy. So now the next thing is you're going to allocate shares to your team. So you've heard from Index Ventures a few moments ago, and actually Index is an investor in our company, which is fantastic. But the advice you've got from Index is probably for much later stage companies. They tend to, tend to invest at Series A or later. But at the beginning of your company, it's, it goes like this. The founders own 100% of the shares when you create your company. And now you find your first employee, maybe your CTO and you want to give them some shares or some share options. And the question is how many to give them. And the problem is it's an arbitrary number. They might go, I want 10%, and you go, I'm going to give you 1%. What's the right number? What I like to do is I like to think, what's the equivalent value that they might get? So let's say you want to hire your CTO, and you want to pay them, well, let's say their market rate is 80,000 euros a year but you can't pay them 80,000 because you don't have any money yet. So you might give them 40,000 euros a year. So they're being underpaid by 40,000 euros a year. And over two years, it's 80,000 euros. And if you think your business value in your first funding round might be a million euros, that's the equivalent of about 8% equity. So when you are negotiating with team members for how much equity they want, I like to always think of it in a money value and then it makes your discussion really easy. Later on, once you have your first funding round, you're now going to create an option pool, and you're going to give share options to people. So certainly in the UK, and probably in other countries as well, if you give shares to people, and the shares have a value, that creates a tax problem for the, the employee and often for the company as well. So you usually give shares to your earliest joiners before they've got value. And once they have value, you create an option pool. Now, you heard from Index that typical option pool sizes might be 15 or 20 percent. And that may well be the case when you get to your second or third funding round. But when you create an option pool, it dilutes the founders. So if you make too big an option pool early on, you're just going to dilute yourself massively. So my data shows in the UK about 50% of companies create an option pool at the beginning, and of those, 10% is the standard amount. Some people do 15, even 20, some 5, but 90% make a 10% option pool. And you may extend that later. 
And when you extend it later, you're going to dilute all your existing shareholders, including you, but not only yourself. So you're better off, in my view, making just the size of the option pool you need to cover you to your next round. Otherwise, you're going to massively dilute yourself. And I should say investors will usually want you to make a big option pool early on because it's diluted you, not diluting them later. So you can see it's a bit of a game between what's good for you as the founder and good for the investor. So now we've got something very briefly, which is for UK companies here, um, and for anyone looking to raise investment from UK angel investors, you can offer them what's called SEIS or EIS tax breaks. And I'm amazed other countries don't have such a system. It fuels the UK startup ecosystem. And investors can deduct from their tax for that year or the previous year 50% of the amount they invest in your company. But it's a little known fact that even if you're not a UK company, you can still offer this to UK investors. So you can drop us a note on Seed Legals and we can show you how you can attract investment from UK investors, I guess with this little known, uh, I shouldn't call it a trick, but this little known method. So you've now built your team, you've given some people options and you now want to raise investment. And now you have to go to figure out how much do I want to raise and what's my company valuation? So here, let me talk about picking your company valuation. Because you've got two problems to solve. Number one, you have to figure out what valuation should I talk to my investors about. And number two, you have to be able to justify it to them. So how are you going to pick a valuation? So imagine that a couple of founders have gotten together, you've worked for a few months, you've built a prototype, uh, you've got some code working, and now you want to raise investment. Is your valuation 100,000 euros, a million, 10 million? Where'd you come up with the number? So one thing you can do is you can go and read TechCrunch. And then you should take at least one zero off the end, because those are insane US valuations that don't work in Europe at all. The other thing is you can read uh, sifted.eu or uh, one of the tech publications that run stories all the time about how much startups raise. But that's no good because they just tell you how much they raise, but not what the valuation is. The next thing is you can go to your accountants and say, help me value my company. But that's no good because your accountant will say, do you make a profit? And you go, oh, no. And they'll go, do you have any revenue? And you go, oh, no. And they'll say, are you losing money? You go, yes. So they'll say, why is the value greater than zero? And that's because accountants value your company based on its existing performance, whereas investors are going to value it based on the future. So what are you going to do? And what I found, oh, and there's one more thing you can do, which is you can use a spreadsheet to try and model your next five or three years revenue and calculate a valuation from that. But I think astute investors know that those are bullshit numbers because you just made them up. And I've seen companies in their uh, pitch decks with five-year projections or even three years of 100 million euros or more for their blockchain company, which is fantastic. But realistically, that's faster growth than Twitter. And if it were true, it would be brilliant. But statistically, it's unlikely. And if people aren't going to buy into your uh, projections, then they're not going to buy into any of your other numbers as well. So what are you going to do? So here I turn to data. So on Seed Legals, we've got fantastic data. And over thousands of funding rounds, what we've seen is companies sell a median of 15% equity in a round. So that's the top of the curve over there. So were you to be raising, let's say, 200,000 euros, you would be raising it at a 1, point, uh, at a 1 million euro pre-money valuation, which means at the end of the round, the investors will own 200 out of 1.2 million, which is one in six, um, which is about 16 or 15%. So actually, from this formula, you've got a few really important things. And I think this is the real value add from this piece, because number one, if an investor comes to you and says, we'd like 25 or 30% of your business, you can go on the Seed Legal's resources deal data, show them this chart, and go, dude, 
you're way off the scale here. This is really atypical. So why is giving away too much equity early on a problem? Well, here's what I think. The life of a startup is basically like this. You're going to do three funding rounds over the life of your company. That might be your goal. And each time, in each round, you're going to raise three to five times the, last of the, the amount of the last round at three to five times the valuation, each time diluting by 15% and making a 10% option pool. And that means after the three rounds, hopefully you don't need to fundraise again because your business is either profitable or you're ready to be acquired and everyone makes a nice exit. But if you run the numbers, three rounds, 15% dilution, 10% option pool, the founders will still own more than 50% of the equity at the end of it. And that's really important. If you start doing three rounds and diluting 25% each time, after three rounds, the founders are in the minority and your investors, to some extent, are running the show. And that's a problem, particularly if business isn't good, you can be out of the business. So your goal, really early on, if you give away too much equity in your first rounds, your investors will see you as uninvestable late, and it's a real problem. And ironically, often it's not astute investors who you give too much equity to. It's often well-meaning friends and family, because you manage to get some friends and family investors together in your first round, and they go, He's so, or she's so nice, she's been spending a few weekends working on this, how could it possibly be worth 300,000 euros? I'm going to invest 50,000 euros for a third of the business. This is a bad thing to do. So in your first round, aim for, you know, no more than really 15% dilution, ideally. So everything I've been talking about here is about doing a funding round. And when we started Seed Legals, our mission was to help founders do their funding rounds much faster and more efficiently. And as you can see, in my mind, there's this 3D worldview of the life of a startup. And if you understand that journey, it's much easier to set your own course there. But now I've realized my goal is to help companies not do a funding round. So what does that mean? Well, once upon a time, you had to get all these investors together, and then there'd be a lead investor, and you had to agree a valuation, and because of, uh, you, you had to pick a large amount to raise because it was complicated and slow to do. And so you might do a funding round every 12 to 18 months, and your goal was to raise enough money to last you 18 months. And that meant you raising uh, equity, uh, you giving away equity today at a valuation today, but you don't need the money until later. And it also means that every 12 or 18 months, you've got this big cycle where you raise lots of money, you're super excited, you've got millions or hundreds of thousands in the bank, and then slowly each month the amount goes down and you start hiring more people, and life gets really, really stressful. And I think it used to be that way because VCs dominated the way you ran funding rounds. It took three months to do the find investors, and then three months to do the legals, and then you had to repeat it all over again, this time at three to five times the valuation, and that takes time to grow. So you've got these big 12 to 18 months kind of go big or go home cycles, but does it have to be that way? And actually, the world is changing really, really rapidly, and we call it agile fundraising. And things are changing in two ways. Number one, ahead of a funding round, you can use something called an advanced subscription agreement. In the US, it's called a SAFE. And in the UK, our brand name is a Seedfast. So this means before a funding round, instead of having to spend time agreeing a valuation with investors and getting all the investors together and doing a shareholders agreement and an article, and the company articles a constitution, you can have a much simpler document that says, the investor says, I will give you money now, and you will give me shares when you do your next funding round. And to incentivize me to come in earlier, I'll get a 10 or 20% discount compared to what the investors are paying later. And by the way, if you don't do a funding round in 12 months or 24 months, it's going to convert into shares anyway at a valuation that we agree now, which we call the long stop valuation. And this method of raising before a funding round 
is now proving insanely popular. And my conversation with startups on Seed Legals normally goes, hey, Anthony, I'm looking to do a funding round. I want to raise a million pounds. Um, but actually, I've got three investors wanting to invest 20K each so far. What should I do? And in the past, I've had to say, well, wait, come back in February when you've got the rest of your round. Now I can say, just send them an advanced subscription agreement or seed fast, get the money in now, use the money to hire people and build your team, and then as you find more investors, you can do your round later. So this is the beginning of agile fundraising. But the other piece after the round is also once upon a time when you did a funding round, you'd say, I wanted to raise a million euros. And then you'd close the round. And you couldn't add more investors easily later, because when you add investors, you have to get all sorts of approvals and do new deal documents. But why does it have to be so difficult? I kept having people come to me at Seed Legals going, I'm looking to raise a million euros. I've got 700,000 euros committed. Should I close the round? What should I do? So we made it a one-click option that you can have a rolling close round. And this means you can do a funding round, raise the least amount that you need, and then seamlessly top up afterwards. And as you add investors afterwards, they sign a document that brings them into the funding round, and the investors in the round give you permission to top up afterwards. So everything in your life as a founder, you might want to pivot from I have to do these big funding rounds to no, I'm going to do some event, I'm going to find some investor at Slush or wherever, and when somebody says, yes, I'd like to invest, you go, let me send you an advanced subscription agreement. Now, of course, it doesn't mean you're not going to do a funding round. You're still going to plan around funding rounds, but you've got now other tools available for you as well. All right, now, I'm going to hop on to a few quick do's and don'ts, and then I'm going to dive into a few of the most important things in your term sheet and funding round. So when you talk to investors, you're going to tell them a valuation. Now, your goal as a founder is when you talk to investors, you want to sound really knowledgeable. If you don't know what you're talking about, then they're going to take advantage of you, and, uh, and they're going to set the terms. So you want to get up to speed on it beforehand. And so the first thing is to pick a valuation. You can use the methodology that I've shown. And if you're a UK company or you think your valuation might match what's in the UK, you'll find a lot of data on that on the Seed Legal site. But now when it comes to talking about a valuation, you can talk about a pre-money or a post-money. So pre-money valuation is the valuation before the new investment is added, and post-money is the valuation afterwards. I've noticed many founders don't know about that, and they just talk about the valuation. And if the investor thinks the valuation is the valuation after the round, the post money, it will turn out when you send them their term sheet that they're getting less equity than they're thinking they were getting. So and you can run those numbers yourself to understand why. So when you talk to an investor, always talk about the pre-money valuation. This is a valuation before I've added your investment. And then they'll know two things. One, you know what you're talking about. You're open and transparent. And you're also you're educating them. Because when you talk to angel investors, many of them don't really know any more than you, maybe a lot less. So if you can help them feel that, oh, they're now understanding, you're not taking advantage of them, they're more likely to invest. So. The other thing is just work out the dilution. So often what will happen is someone will say, I'm raising 100,000 euros at a 1 million euro pre-money valuation. This means after the round, my investors will own 100,000 out of 1.1 million, so 9.09%. So they then go, great, I've added one investor, and this is what your dilution will be. And the investor's excited, but then they add more investors, and that dilution decreases. So always try to pick the total amount you're raising, work out what percent the investor would get once you've filled the round, and that's the number to go to them with, otherwise they'll be disappointed later. So, the next thing, I'm going to spend a few moments on the most important deal terms. So when you do a funding round, 
you've got like a hundred pages of dense legal documentation, but actually 98% of it is just boilerplate stuff that's very important, but not the key deal terms. And everything in a funding round is going to resolve on the equity that the investors get and really the, the, the control of your company. And here's, once you understand that, then a lot more things make sense. So for an investor, their main uh, worry is that, uh, firstly, of course, that your invention won't work out, your drone won't fly, and they'll lose their money. But they're also worried that the founders who've got most of the shares in the company, in your first round, the founders will still have 80% of the shares or more. So they're worried that the founders have got all the votes and can do anything they want. So they want certain investor protections. They want to protect themselves that you don't issue more shares to yourself and dilute them. Maybe they want to avoid you just selling the company for less than the value that they got in their round, and therefore you making money, but they losing money. Or they might want to have a protection so you don't pivot the company. You decide you're bored with this drone thing, you're going to be the new OnlyFans site, and they didn't want to be an investor in an OnlyFans kind of business. So your shareholder agreement will normally contain investor consent rights. And the investors might want a seat on your board as well. Now, on the, as you as a founder, realizing this, you, you need to understand that the investor isn't going to invest, at least a professional, astute VC investor, unless they get some level of protections themselves. But you also want the freedom to run your business yourself on a daily basis. So I think company governance works like this. If you think of your company structure as a pyramid, at the top of the pyramid is the CEO. And as the CEO at Seed Legals, if I want to buy a new coffee machine, I don't need to ask anybody, I just buy it. But if I want to hire someone for a 200,000 euro salary, actually I need to go to the board because we would run out of money if we kept hiring people crazily. So the next level down is to go to your board and that's a great way as a founder or CEO to spread the risk. The board together votes, should we launch in the US? Should we do some crazy new thing? so that nobody gets fired afterwards, and the board, which could include the investors, has a say in things. One level down from that are things that need the consent of your investors, usually 50% majority of the investors. And one level down from that are things that just have a shareholder vote. And this is where I think founders are wrong about Zuckerberg and needing special voting shares, because at least in the early stage of the business, the founders have all of the shares, you've got all the votes. So everything else in a funding round is about investors trying to claw back some protections for themselves. And if they see you doing anything non-standard, they just go to invest in someone else who's making it less difficult than you are. So the last thing is due diligence. Now, this is one of the things I learned at Seed Legals, uh, or in fact, a few startups ago. So when you start your business, you meet up in the pub or a restaurant, you uh, informally get some people to start doing graphics design and writing copy and doing some coding. You haven't got any agreements with anybody because it's just a hobby. And now slowly it turns into a real thing. And then later on you start doing your Series A round and you have an investor like Index Ventures and they're going to say, great, we would now like to do due diligence on your company. We want to check it doesn't have any outstanding debts, that no one's suing it, but also that you own all your intellectual property. And that means it's really, really important that you have contracts in place with anybody who's done any work on your project. And what I find, and then just to wrap up, is interestingly, founders think that investors are going to screw them. And they put all this effort into trying to protect themselves against investors. But actually what I find is the, the people founders have to protect themselves against are their co-founders. Because my anecdotal data shows that about 10% of the time, founders split up. And so having founder agreements at the early stage is really important. With founder vesting, so if you split up, the departing founder gives back their shares, transfers it back to the company, and you can find somebody else. So on this slightly boring 
topic of uh, due diligence. I think that's largely it for me. Do we have any questions in the audience? And I know I'm not meant to ask questions, but I thought, is there any question to be had? Question back there. I, I tell you what, go, go for it. Seed stage founder? Yeah, and we've just hosted seed rounds. Yes. We need to do a good round. Right. And we don't have EIS because I started when I was 19, we've got some R&D. But we do get R&D tax credit. So you can see the results with that loophole to get EIS. We have a fantastic, very UK question, so I'll catch up with you directly afterwards on that. <laughs> All right. OK, everyone, thank you so much. I'm Anthony at SeedLegals.com. You can head over to the Seed Legals website where there's a huge amount of data and resource. Uh, we're in the UK, we're in France, we're in Ireland. We're about to launch in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong uh, and, and hopefully Finland on the roadmap one of, one of these days. Thank you, everyone.